This podcast is for you if you want to learn about the wonderful and wacky world of the English language and the people who speak it. If you want to learn English, speak English, and understand different speakers of English, then you're in the right place and you're going to love our podcast episode today. Welcome to English World with Chris Americos. We are a team of language lovers, expert teachers, and native speakers who are on a mission to help people around the world speak English and show the world their true value. We correct mistakes, practice pronunciation, and explore grammar rules while drinking coffee and having fun. So get comfortable, relax, grab a pen and paper, and welcome to the show. Today's episode is brought to you by English Every Day, an unlimited speaking practice program where you can join live speaking practice lessons with professional native teachers five times every day. There are a lot of courses on the internet and a lot of useful videos too, but the one thing that is missing for most English learners is practice. And if you need speaking practice, then English Every Day is for you. So click the link in the description or go to chrisamericoast.com to learn more today. So today we have Jason with us, Fluency MC, and this is not our first time talking. So we're just going to kind of speed right through everything that we've gone through before. So, you know, just tell everybody who's listening or watching, um, you know, how you got started and how you got to where you are now. Sure. Um, well, yeah, thanks for having me, Chris. Good to be back. Um, how did I get started? Uh, I started teaching English um, about 25 years ago and started training teachers um, pretty soon after that and teaching test prep pretty soon after that. So I got I got really into uh, what I was doing. To, uh, did the did the CELTA um, and and then did a master's in New York. Uh, but yeah, as, as far as like more specifically what I do, uh, I, I create songs. Uh, to help students practice English, uh, specifically rap songs that that I write, and I also tour around the world and perform them with students, uh, as well as having them available for them to use on in social media. Um, I didn't start that right away. It was about ten years in uh, to to my teaching career that I began to write my own stuff. But I used music before, but but not uh, songs that I'd written. Uh, so I'll try to tell you more about that as, as we go. Um, but yeah, so that that led me to then uh, tr- starting to travel around the world, getting invitations to to uh, perform with students and train teachers um, with the, the method I was using to develop the techniques, um, you know, in different countries. And uh, now I live in France. Uh, because there's more work for me here. My fam- my family is, um, my kids are bilingual French English. So there are other reasons why we're here as well. And yeah, I, I, I teach at two universities here uh, a couple days a week. And the other days I reserve for uh, workshops for students really that kind of like shows and, uh, and teacher training. And um, almost all of that is, is in person. It's in uh, physical schools that I go to, um, but I also squeeze in, uh, some some webinars and some some courses uh, uh, online as well. That's so cool, man. I was kind of watching you grow with that first video that really hit and got a lot of people's attention. The what was it, irregular verbs? Get stuck, stuck. Yeah, there's a part two. So <laughs> I, saw it, I saw it, but yeah, <laughs> but um, yeah, the first one goes goes back pretty far. Yeah, man. When was that? <laughs> when did you put that out? Well, when I wrote it and when I started using it and putting it out are, are three different things. Uh, okay. I mean, when I, when I started using it, it was pretty soon after I wrote it. That's pretty much the same. That's 2007. And I put it out 2011. So for four years, I was using it uh, along with other songs I'd written. By the time I put it out in 2011, I'd already, you know, written put and put music to and put on CDs for my students. I mean, wow. maybe 20 different songs at that point. That was the first one I put out as a video because my students were like hey you know youtube i was kind of late getting into that they were like oh you know you should put this out so other people can practice so it wasn't like my my classes were me rapping it was more like i rapped in the classroom to show you know this these were the idea was and still is to practice at home with the songs not to do it as a classroom activity but to use the class for you know communicative activities that you're able to succeed in uh, far more often because you've got all the content, you've got all the target language in your head from the video. So it's kind of a flipped classroom thing that you know that I started way back, um, so that students could do better by having more of the, the grammar and vocabulary from the songs. So yeah, for four years I had CDs only. Put that put the song out um, 
luckily people got into it really quickly. So it, it, uh, it you know, motivated me to do more. I got gained confidence in what I was doing and started making more. So the, the people who have seen the stick stuck, stuck video, I yeah. think they probably have the impression that that's what your workshop is like. <laughs> it's funny. I mean, when, when I do live stuff with students, it is, it is like that, but I do, you know, I have a screen with animated text and videos and we do, it's, it's, it's like a rap show call and response and we're practicing with whatever, whatever it is that we decide we're going to practice. More of a with. Show. So it's more of a show than a lesson. Oh, it's a show. It's, it's a, show. a show. It's a show. And I'm the MC in the sense that I'm, that I'm rapping, but I'm also the MC in the sense that I'm like, you know, getting the crowd going, telling jokes, bringing people on stage for different stuff. Kids often come up and, and beatbox and do their own raps and dance. And so, yeah, no, no, it's, it's a, it's a show, show, show. Yeah. And there's stuff on my YouTube channel. If you're curious or on Instagram, you can see, but when I train teachers, it's less, it's, it's more like, uh, you know, going through what I do and yeah. Uh, talking about talking about the pedagogy behind it. Uh huh. Yeah. So maybe you can hit us with a qu couple of the quick points of you know how music or how uh, I guess any kind of music, but especially music that's focused on lyrics, mm -hmm. uh, help students learn a language. Sure. Uh, I mean, as I mentioned earlier, I've been using music before. I think every language teacher you know, uses music at some point. Uh, the greatest thing about it, as far as helping students learn language uh, th that I realized at first was just because it's, it's you know, it's content that's, you know, they're, they bring in, talk about culture, talk about, you know, uh, differences, similarities and people and styles, you know, especially if, you know, I was teaching in New York for many years. So when, when the period I'm talking about, it was students, who, there were students who were really, you know, curious about American culture. So, you know, songs were great for that. Um, the limitation was that, you know, sometimes what was in the song wasn't appropriate or was too difficult or uh, it was, you know, it was infrequent language because the person writing it's not writing it to teach English. So that's when it occurred to me, wait a second, you know, I'm a hip hop DJ. I grew up with this uh, music. My students were super curious about hip hop in New York, especially because it started in New York. Uh, and because hip hop uh, is international, as, as you <laughs> uh, know very, very well, and everywhere in the world, it's universal. So they, they, it's something that could connect the classroom. So, uh, but back to music, not not rap for a second again. So as you said, lyrics, you know, lyrics, it's, it's content, you know, it's language. Uh, and the great thing about music with lyrics is, you know, English, because it's rhythm based, because the sound spelling relationships are all over the place, when you see the lyrics while you're listening, and this is great, you know, audio books, uh, you know, subtitles, et cetera. But, you know, when, when, you're, when you're looking at the words and hearing them, you can make those connections with how the words sound so that you know nobody says do like do they say do but no go so like, it's not a problem uh -huh. they don't have to think about the phonetics because they've heard the word and seen it enough times but then you get a word like you know though if they don't it, you know they may hear that word and see that word but they're not making the connection so when they're reading they might say do or you know something like yeah. that so so the more the more they're listening to music while they're reading the less there has to be like, let's talk about phonetics and, you know, how these minimal pair, you know, like that stuff can usually is not as interesting as and goes more slowly than just when it comes naturally. Um, and I've said all of that without even talking about the fact that, you know, um, rhyme <laughs> helps you remember language, uh, rhythm helps you remember language. And um, yeah, there's, yeah, I can go on. Uh, there's so many things. I mean, you know, some is, is music, language is language music you know there's even that itself you could go on that's true uh, yeah that's <laughs> my and and when you were talking it reminded me of a psychological study that was done about people talking to a beat and like mm -hmm. um, mostly this study was done around like the trance state that people can go into a trance and mm. focused and mm -hmm. that the beat that the words are spoken to uh aids this process and so like you can be you can get yourself into this english trance and like really absorb the the words and and feel it you know 
Absolutely. And like, you know, the uh, students tell me all the time, I'm not religious myself, but I hear stories about like, you know, learning the Torah or learning uh, Quran, the Quran, like, with ch- you know, like just that idea of, of reading and chanting and it's like, yeah. uh, helps helps you remember. <laughs> so if you're in a meditative state or in a kind of, I can see how that could even be more intense, you know. Absolutely. But rap and English teaching are things mm. or two that most people don't put together. And I'm sure yeah. you felt some pushback there. Have you had people tell you like, hey, this isn't correct English or hey, mm. this like like because right. because you're code switching also, right? Not too much. I mean, well, let me explain. I mean, when when I started, like Stick Stuck Stuck, you know, happened to be the first song I wrote and and the first song I put out. But as I said, between when I wrote it and put out, I had already made a bunch of stuff. So I was testing it out a lot with students. My students, you know, it's before it went onto social media. So that's one, you know, I had I was training teachers, too. So there was some question about it, but it wasn't about the the language itself because I wasn't code switching. It was very standard English, always was. Uh, and, and that's because that was the whole point was that as much as, you know, I love rap English, my students love rap English. It's not the English they needed for their job interview, for the supermarket <laughs> Yeah. You know, for 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 the for the TOEFL, so so you know, I, I was motivated to make you know TOEFL raps. You know, I mean, one of the first <laughs> raps I made uh, is is uh, talking about like you know uh, academic verbs that are on the TOEFL. It's called Verbs One. You can find it, but like you know, like to me, it was it wasn't even like oh, this is a, a sacrifice that I'm not using, you know, uh, dialect or you know, Black American English or rap English or a sub or a different, you know. It was it was the opposite. It was like these two things can coexist. So the only what I did have is I had a lot of, you know, uh, feedback about like how to make things even even better. I didn't really get so much criticism. Now, when I when I went on to social media, the only the only times once in a while I'll get criticized is people thinking like, you know, you know, this is a little corny. and, And you realize when they say it's corny, they're not learning English. You know, yeah. uh, invariably, somebody who's kind of, you know, by chance, you know, hit, fell on my video. They were looking for like, you know, an MC who's doing hip hop in 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 the music business side. You know, so I mean, so like, I try to make things. I want my students, you know, to want to listen. I mean, that's the whole point. You don't make music, especially if you want them to learn without them wanting to repeat it. So if they don't like the music, you know, if they don't like the lyrics, they're not going to repeat it. And, you know, I'm writing this stuff for adolescents and adults. So the bar to me, it's, it's, it's very high as far as like, you know, I have, I have to make sure that I'm, 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 you know, using the English they need, but in a way that they think is not corny. So I haven't had problems uh, really with students or teachers feeling, feeling like that. Um, uh, but great. I have people think like, yeah. And, and, you know, and I also I also do my like when we did a video, when we did a song together, um, you know, you can go back and look at what I wrote. It's 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 more in like the style of like a real rap song, maybe not an educational rap song, but all, you know, the grammar, the vocabulary, everything. It's it's you know, there's there's no slang. There's no code switching. And like, that's just that's just what I do. Uh huh. Cool. Cool. Well, that's good to hear that like your work has been well received, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've, I've, um, there's, there's always people. I mean, pe- people, uh, honestly, like I've, I've had more just like, you know, you should make a rap about this or why don't uh-huh. you, you know, expand more about that? I've been lucky, really. I haven't, I haven't had a lot of haters or, or, or people saying that, you know, they didn't like what I, what I do so far. <laughs> <laughs> So for you, how would you describe like the YouTube English teaching space overall? Because in my experience, there's there's a lot of good stuff, but there's a decent amount of negativity too. And absolutely, absolutely. And before I answer that question, let me tell you, I'm I'm not as active on YouTube as I used to be. And when I was really active on YouTube, it was earlier where I think there was less of that. It, there was still some of it, but there was less of it. So yeah. if if I if I started to get active again, and I may or may not uh, on YouTube, I mean I use it I use it to get more work 
for shows. It really helps right. with that. Um, but it, but as far as like really putting effort into it as a job, which you have to do if you really want to get a return for on your investment, like I don't really do that. So I, maybe that's also why I don't get as many negative comments as I might. Um, but it's an interesting question you ask because I'm, I'm reading this book. I literally have it next to me. This was not a planned endorsement. Nice. Jennifer, uh, Jennifer, Jennifer ESL or English or Jennifer, she's an old friend of mine. Um, she she actually wrote three pages in here about me, which is so amazing. She's like, oh, I mentioned you in my book. And I was like, then I read it. I'm like, oh, my God. That's awesome. I don't know if you're aware, but she was actually a guest on this podcast. I am aware. Ever, yeah. Like she was a judge in um, the last battle English battle that we had. And oh, I didn't know that. I'll have to show you that one later. Yeah. Okay. Very cool. I knew she was on. Um, And it's funny because she was just here visiting Paris and came over uh so she was actually here with her kids and anyway uh so you know what i'm about to say because she writes a lot about that uh in this book so i'm sure she i didn't i didn't see what you guys did has that been published or has it yeah been published yeah yet? yeah, yeah okay, i don't know why i missed it i just knew she was on a i'll send it over she, after yeah okay I'll, I'll i'll i've been busy so i haven't noticed it but yeah she she gets she also you know she's been in it for since 2007 <laughs> So uh, she also mentions that early on people were kinder and and blah blah blah. So I think is you know YouTube. I mean, first of all, um, if 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 you're a teacher who's you know getting, are you talking about sort of getting started, or are you talking about people that are already kind of uh, successful? Maybe well, I guess, ask before answering. Yeah, I, I guess the people who are getting started are going to kind of be the people who we're trying to give advice to right now right because mm, perfect we've done that okay. we've been there but we see what's happening with the people at our level yeah. and we can say mm -hmm. like there's some good some bad right yeah but, but getting started i mean there's to me the best formula and i've seen it uh so many times and and when i do when i'm in your spot and i'm interviewing people because i've done that a lot uh, and they're telling me how they build up on Instagram or YouTube. It's almost always they start. Uh, it's kind of like what I did too. Um, you know, before social media, you know, you start with your own students. Like they're your following. You know, if 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 you don't have st students, that's different. But I also think you know, get some. You know, teach a class. Do you know, try stuff out that then you can you know use social media as a way to connect with those students outside of class. So I did it with CDs, right? <laughs> Uh, you know, you do it and, and that your Instagram or your YouTube, you're not worrying about like blowing it up and, you know, you can kind of keep it focused on just a place, you know, where you're experimenting and your students are giving you all this love and, and advice and that kind of thing. And then I think you get the confidence, you know, to kind of make it more open. And, you know, uh, then, you know, it, it, what's healthy and unhealthy about social media is a very tricky one these days i think and it also depends on your character um but i think the the diff the big difference today is that i think you know um as i said earlier you know youtube if we're talking about youtube specifically and that was your question it, it really is like a job i mean i guess all of these platforms are now like if you if you think okay i want to go in there and i want to become really successful i want to make money from advertising all that stuff you know you really you really have to uh devote a lot of time and, and be smart and know things like what what chris americos can teach you about marketing and so forth it's not just going to be how good the content is which is back to if if you're like me and you just want to make sure the content gets better and better and better, uh, then I think, you know, doing it in parallel with teaching in, in uh, real life is, is a great way. And if you, if you get good enough at it, um, like you and a lot of others, you can just go just into online, you know, but people who go right into online, uh, I think without that kind of experience, you know, um, it's, it's, it's going to be tough. <laughs> yeah. I, that's that's an interesting point to bring up because I guess that that's where some criticism does come up for some creators uh, that some people call them out, say, what are your credentials? What are your qualifications? Where are your certificates? And yeah. then they, especially if you're a non-native teacher, then there's this added level of judgment that people throw at you, which is like, why are you teaching the language if you don't know it? And it comes across, you, you know what I mean? But you've probably seen yeah. some of this. All the time. I mean, I've trained, not, I'm a sort of, one of my specialties is in, in my years of experience training non-native uh, speakers to be English teachers. So to me, this is disgraceful and it's outrageous because, I mean, this would be another discussion and we don't go down that road necessarily. But, you know, there's so many reasons why non-native teachers uh, become better teachers than a lot of native speaking teachers. So that's, there's that. 
but 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 yeah i mean i think but the whole thing about credentials and certificates i mean if your stuff is there are people out there right who who don't have those credentials and certificates and and their stuff is garbage okay so maybe then you start to think you know it's not that who cares about a certificate as much as maybe you didn't do anything to get this you know tri- you don't have the experience you know certificate or no certificate you've got to have experience right Mm -hmm. So if somebody's calling you out because you actually, your content is bad and even worse, you're kind of duping people into paying for things, you know, that, that's, that's not cool, (laughs) you know, and and that could be native speaker or non-native speaker. But I'm, I'm guessing what you're saying is people putting, throwing accusations out when, you know, the content, the rapport with the students, everything is, is so good. Who cares? I mean, especially online, if people are like, who's to say who's the best online teacher? It's the teacher you connect with. You know, Jennifer talks a lot about that in her book. Like there are different styles or different approaches, you know, and, 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 you know, you know, if you're doing, if you're making a connection students or cause they're, they're messaging you. Oh my God, I did so much better on my test. Oh, I feel so much more motivated to, to do English. You know, at that point, who cares about credentials? But I don't think that it's as easy if you just say, oh, so I can just get in and, and do this. I mean, I think without the experience, it, 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 you know, that's not going to happen to you um, in most cases. Yeah. Yeah. Looking back, for me, the offline experience was really crucial. Like, mm. I didn't know what I was doing, really. And I went mm-hmm. in teaching in right. to the school. <laughs> And I, after a year and a half, I was like, okay, I've taught these books a few times. And, and then I got yeah. my own students offline and, and then moved that online. Yeah. But basically if I like moving online, I already had that offline structure to kind of imitate. So mm-hmm. that was, I think that was key. But, but then again, like these days I can see how a person could get trained as a teacher, start online and oh, yeah. a career online and never touch offline. That's right. But but I would I would think again, like that online only experience as a teacher would be in some shape, way or form, you know, interacting with students live. Right. For a report. Maybe not. So that's let's talk about that, Um, because I do know I, I can name off the top of my head three or four really great people who have never taught. Uh, in a physical classroom or uh, or uh, also they've never taught in, you know, a, a lesson, a live lesson on Zoom or whatever. Uh-huh. They they started, um, you know, doing stuff on, on Instagram, um, especially Instagram, not usually YouTube, where they just, you know, they were, um, you know, brilliant storyteller or just somebody who was really funny and was in another country. So they started getting fans, you know, and, and then they learned a lot about, about English teaching on their own and they're doing stuff that way. Uh, it's more niche, you know, stuff, I think. And so I think that's possible. I think that's possible. Yeah. Maybe, maybe we're kind of scratching on one of the underlying issues here that the barrier to entry for becoming an English teacher is so low for native mm. speakers, right? Mm. So like, people yeah. think I speak English, boom, let's yeah. monetize that. And totally. like, I'm sure it happens with every language, but since English is the biggest one that gets all this focus uh, internationally, then like we, we see it all the time, just unqualified people or just anybody mm. really can either do That's it right. themselves and try to do it or get a job in a school. And it really demeans the the non-native teachers who have spent the time and energy and focus to get a four-year degree in, in mm. teaching English or in pedagogy or something, yeah. right? Yeah. 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 Well it's, it's it's you're exactly right. And and you know the funniest part to me and the most tragic part is you're saying like the non-native speakers who get the four-year degree. What, also if you're a non-native speaker and you don't even have any degree but you've learned English to to a high proficiency, that's your qualification more than yeah. the native speaker idiot <laughs> just, you know, that has no perspective at all on his or her first language. The native yeah. speaker the non-native speaker already has you beat for, yeah. at the gate. Because they've learned, you know, and you're sitting there like, I don't know any other languages. You know, we're just talking again about that person, like you just said, who's, you know, because they just speak English, 
and and English. And and by the way, people are like, well, if you want a French teacher, don't you want a native speaker? Well, me personally, not necessarily, but I just want this to go out there. You can't compare the idea of wanting, an, in my opinion, you can't compare the idea of wanting a native speaker of Korean and teach you Korean as opposed to non-native the same way as English. English is a world language, period. Okay, so the, the whole point is being able to communicate globally. So, you know, that's not the case with these other languages. So that's yeah. to me, that's the first argument. You've got to start there, you know, because it's it's not going to be the Australian or the American or the Canadian that's going to necessarily have that scope of how English needs to be used in the world, as opposed to a non-native speaker of the language. So there's that already but anyway we can yeah talk. yeah yeah no i feel i feel, <laughs> you, I feel you on that point because i but but like playing devil's advocate right the yeah. the student like a lot of times the student will have an experience where they go to canada uk australia us and they meet joe blow on the street somewhere who's never yeah. left his his county or whatever yeah and <laughs> you, yeah. you know what i mean and and yeah. that person has absolutely no understanding that English is this global connection mm, device. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah, and so yeah, like you yeah. and me, you and I have a really cool experience in our lives that we were gifted with that gives us this perspective because we've had to connect with so many people, not only using English, but other languages too. And so you, we That's really, right. and then teaching so many people how to use it, we really have a feel for it as a tool, but for people who just speak it on a daily basis, yeah, it's just kind of like this automatic thing that happens, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that kind of, I'd rather have that person in as a conversation guest. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know what I mean? Exactly. <laughs> you know, use what they do with their language as a way to help the students, but uh, not necessarily as the teacher, right? Absolutely. So the so students, though, kind of get off track here, right? Because they see that guy, that random guy, and they're like, well, I don't understand him. He doesn't understand me. Yeah. But 80% of the international community would understand yeah. this person speaking, but that random guy there doesn't. And so students <laughs> make this mistake, right? They try to like, I they try it. to get an accent, like imitate an accent, mm, of, mm, like mm. local niche down version yeah. of the language. And it you, makes it harder right. to understand. I think we're in a transition, though. You know, I, I don't think that's going to be the case for much longer. And and maybe it's a moot point as we move into like AI and stuff anyway, like as a way of how we communicate uh, internationally and globally uh, with, yeah. with translation tools and, and everything else. So, I mean, yeah, yeah. Um, no, that's a good point to bring up, too, because, you know, like even if AI uh, can automatically generate the language for us, right? So mm. if we speak or even later think and then it mm. produces this communication whether it's that's text or voice or something right so mm. um after that happens we still will face the issue of the cultural aspects of language absolutely and, get, and guess who's going to help most with that <laughs> it's like again <laughs> people with experience whether yeah. they're native or native the, the passionate people you know if you can't teach better than a robot then you should be replaced by one is is, is basically the way it's going to be right there's going to be a need for teachers but it's going to be the really the ones who've got the the people skills, the ones who can really talk about the culture and all of that. That can use you know best of both worlds. Use all the great uh, you know corp corpora language from AI. You know because the stuff is so good. <laughs> you know people are like, yeah. what do you think of language models? I'm like, well, in my world, you know, it's all about like collocations and how frequent idioms are and whatever. You know, the internet will say, oh, these are the most common phrasal verbs, whatever. You know. <laughs> But that's somebody's blog. I want I want a corpus. So now I don't just have like, you know, the coca or the British corpus. I've got, you know, GPT. And that that is like if you ask if you ask GPT to give you, you know, the high frequency language or to make this paragraph more this style or this style, come on. You know, it's, yeah. it's so good. It's so good. It's not, I don't care like about, you know, if the information is accurate about the history, this is not language, large language models are built for this, for how good the language is. And, and that that's amazing, really. Absolutely. So, yeah. So some people will adopt this new technology and some people won't. Um, what do you think is healthy competition when we're talking about education, hmm. when we're talking 
about YouTube creators or social media creators and education, you know, because it gets blurred a lot. Like earlier, you brought up the example, like, oh, if the person is putting out garbage and then they're trying to sell you a course that's not going to teach you anything, then that's not good. And so, yeah. like, um, that plays into this, like, blurred line between business and education, right? True. Yeah, that's a really interesting one. Healthy competition between teachers. I mean, I've felt, maybe again, I'm lucky, I'll speak from my own experience, that I've observed other things that are not so so healthy. But for me, it's always been about, like, especially early on with Facebook, like being in groups and learning from, from teachers and competing in the sense that, like, you know, you know I want to try this also or make it better. And, like, you know, just kind of, like, bigging each other up along the way you know um but again i feel like i've been really fortunate maybe I, not everybody has that experience and maybe now it's I, I definitely see now with algorithms changing or whatever i mean i i'm i'm a co-admin in the biggest by far uh facebook group of english teachers especially international english teachers and if i put up a question or something it goes into like four people's feeds three hundred and fifty thousand members it's not <laughs> a page it's in group and that's because we don't do anything to that facebook wants us to do with trying to promote it and everything else so so it used to be right you could really get a lot of almost instant feedback from, so maybe it's harder now uh, but anyway um i'm digressing a bit from the question so healthy competition i think is maybe it's easier to talk about unhealthy competition but healthy mm -hmm. competition is more about like either direct collaboration uh where uh you know you're not competing uh but there's a little there's a little bit of motivation to see like you know how many people are going to be into your thing because you're doing it with these people or those people uh or uh it's uh not collaboration but um it's you know again just mot motivated by seeing somebody else do you know getting more views doing a certain type of video and say okay maybe i want to try that not change who i am you know not 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 be someone I'm not, but I want to like, you know, uh, com compete in a way of sort of doing my thing, but maybe using this technology this way uh, that this person's doing. Um, unhealthy competition, uh, you know, um, again, because I'm, I'm not out there really looking and trying to kind of, you know, seeing how many views I have and trying to, to make it more in, in the digital space. Uh, I thought about it for a bit and now I'm not, I mean, again, um, but but definitely the unhealthy competition is, you know, uh, people just stealing other people's ideas or being like, you know, uh, overly critical as a way to get attention to what they're doing uh, when when, you know, it's the worst kind of hating. Right. When they're not creative enough <laughs> to do their own thing. So they're, you know, they're messing around, uh, kind of bullying somebody else, uh, you know, to try to make it look like they know more, that kind of thing. Um, I'm not sure if I answered your question. <laughs> no, no, no. I think that I think that hit it, you know, hit the nail on the head. Um, it reminds me of one example. How would you feel if someone dedicated their channel to making videos about mistakes that you made in your videos? Does anybody do that? Do yeah. people do that, or is this really hypothetical? They do. That's horrible. It's, this is not hypothetical. This is uh, okay, yeah, I, very like you've been off YouTube for a while, but like. When yeah. you come back, there's surprises waiting for you. So, <laughs> I, you know what I have seen um, before before you I answer the question. What I have seen, and I don't like it. Actually, a colleague of mine, I won't, won't name, name, a college just collaborator, a great guy who has great stuff. Uh, he never does stuff like that. He did a video though where he com kind of complained about a style of video, not not one person's. Uh, not one teachers, but he complained about a style. I totally get it because I don't like it either, which is like, you know, you shouldn't say this. You should say this. You know, don't, don't say, say this. this. Stop saying this. And, and I totally I totally agree. But but he got a lot of backlash on his video. First of all, he doesn't didn't usually do that. He's this really creative guy and he does his own stuff, you know, and he made one video where he was saying he didn't like that. And he he didn't make direct reference, but he made enough. He, you know, it was clear who he was talking about, and people just jumped on him. And he came back with a video like he was so sad and apologetic. He was like, "Guys, I'm so sorry that that was so oh, stupid. Why did I do that?" So I was like, "Okay, cool, man. That's cool. You did that." Um, but but what you're talking about is something even <laughs> something we're not. You know, saying like you know actually like you know this mistake and this is not how this is done. Is that what you mean? Like 
even yeah. like typos, typos in what you do. And, you know, you're not a well, real like, teacher. Th- this is where, this is where the, the criticism has come up. And there's like, they, they have actually like garnered a really serious following, um, mm. very active. And, no, I'm curious. I'm gonna have to check and this out. was I'm built, curious. built on the back of a channel that has like 4 million, 5 million subscribers and that they, they just like went after this channel like fill me not. in after and so curious. this happened for like a year and a half already straight okay. um so it's like, continuing now oh yeah it's still going and uh there's like a huge spotlight on it but um but yeah i'll 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 send you something okay. after this. So like the, the, the last the last i was really following i i guess it just it, it wore me out actually which is why maybe i haven't seen this one the whole native speaker non-native speaker thing oh yeah uh, with uh again why name names although at the time i was i was in podcasts and interviews talking about it a lot because i was really pissed off let's just say it involves kangaroo english on one side uh and another channel on the other side we'll just uh, well anyway it doesn't matter kangaroo english was was the the good side of it and it was talking about a certain channel that was focusing too much on a native speaker being better yeah. and so so i followed that and i was very vocal about that but after that i was so exhausted that um you know i i, I don't think I'm, <laughs> i think i just don't look for stuff like that but now i think i'm, I'm curious i'll check it out so now that you brought up that i'm really interested because um I'll, I'll have to send you this video that we put out like a month and a half ago or so uh that talks about both of these situations together in one video. Oh. So I'll uh, I'll send that over to you. But um, interesting what you oh. just said about the kangaroo or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Um, so like you, so you think it's okay that he made that criticism? Now that's interesting too, because he came back and kind of uh, not apologized, but kind of like yes and no. I mean, I think the way the way he did it, and I didn't know. Uh, I didn't know him that well when I first saw it. So I was like, once I started to get to know him, um, anyway, things changed a little bit. So, so maybe, maybe it wasn't right. Maybe it wasn't right. But I think, I think the fact that he brought the discussion to the spotlight, I mean, what happened too, if if you know the story is, is, is the daily mail in London, uh, which this, person's channel to talk about it they have a they, they put her stuff in a column so it's 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 not just on youtube it's going out about you yeah. know certain accents are better than others and all that stuff and that's just right. that gets so heated you know well you and, see and, i, I guess got him funny. heated too but but it's true he didn't put a whole series out he put out a thing where he was just saying he thought it was wrong uh but yeah i'm not super happy with 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 how it all went down but i i am happy that it brought more people into the conversation that, that hadn't been thinking about it. You know, it, that that is what I liked about it. And because I think more people left that thinking, oh yeah, it didn't occur to me. I just thought a native speaker teacher was better, you know? Uh-huh. Or so accent was better. I never really thought about that before. You know, that's the same with like, you know, race relations, gender stuff, you know, it's like, oh, you know what? I never thought about it. You know, I like when that happens because that that's when things can really change. You know? Right. Um, well, yeah, I, th- I think it's good to provoke that kind of thought. Um, but unfortunately in a lot of those situations there's a scapegoat right ah true uh yeah yeah and, and especially it, when something gets too popular it's fine you know or not so and, popular and, and this like, is this down. comes up every if there time was motivation, right? if there was motivation to take the person down because of their popularity then that gets me also really upset uh, see so and that's a that factor involved, here. And that's not cool that's not and that's cool. a if that's a factor that has to be considered here too because you're right. you even said, yeah, you even you're said right. like they publish her in the daily mail so so this level of credibility uh the audience is assigning some level of responsibility to them like now that you have this thing or that so many people see it it has such visibility so now you're more responsible and that's interesting how people maybe wouldn't be so critical of someone who didn't get so many views sure 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 but the other the argument then is also just you know they're reaching so many more people. They have so much more influence on it. So if they're if they're saying stuff like you know this accent is better than that or whatever, if you're if you're not reaching a lot of people, <laughs> it's it's not as it's not doing as much you know damage as a strong word. But anyway, I, I hear what you're saying. Yeah, I hear what you're saying. But back to your question. I mean, uh, it, it's funny because I, if if somebody made what would I do? I mean, if somebody made a channel or even just a video, you know. Uh, 
coming down on what I do and critiquing it, I would, I would definitely, you know, uh, feel, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sensitive about stuff. You know, I'd, I'd feel like defensive. I, you know, but I try to think, you know, why they did it, what would be a way to respond if at all. Yeah. So, I mean, for me, like over the years, like when people have um, made comments, like, you know, I spelled Tunisia wrong once, or like I, I actually, I put, I put a map of Africa and Moroccan students got crazy because oh. of the hair yeah. and it, like that kind of stuff so you know i i get i get that um but it's 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 usually like people that you know the reason they notice it so so close is because they follow me and they already like what i do so they're just kind of pointing it out they're not they're not getting on my case about it and then i have a song about the world's capitals that in the end when it got to israel and palestine what i do now when i do it as i just say you know uh and the and the um historic cities in israel and palestine you know or something i don't say anything about ramallah or or Beth- bethlehem but anyway so yeah i mean if if somebody uh created a channel uh to talk about how like learning english through rap is is you know uh bs and that's not it doesn't work and this you know this what's this guy been doing trying to teach teach that way i think it would be so you know what their claims would be so preposterous that i just either wouldn't respond or it'd be really easy to be like okay i see why there might be a knee-jerk reaction that what i do doesn't work but you know here's all of this <laughs> experience you know i have so much evidence of it working that it, yeah. I, I don't put the evidence out there because to me it's sort of self-evident what I do um, and with the comments I get from students about how it's helped. But, you know, I also have all kinds of stuff if I needed to, to show how, yeah. how well it works. Well, may- maybe not if they, maybe not if they were all, were all like, you're a complete fraud. Not, not like that, but you mentioned before you made a mistake spelling Tunisia <laughs> wrong, right? Okay. So, so like, imagine that somebody okay. yeah. took that mistake from your video and they make a video and they're like, this is not correct. And then they show you, they show you, teaching the wrong yeah. thing yeah. and then yeah. they say this yeah. is the correct thing learn correct english and then yes. and then the title of the the title of the video is uh do not make mistakes by fluency mc and it has your face on the cover that is yeah. ludicrous wow yeah. so yeah here but hey you made the mistake you made the mistake you left up the video it's your fault right Wow. I mean, I guess the only silver lining of this is that it just means that there's so much educational stuff going, getting out there that this would happen in education the way it would happen, like, you know, in sports or in, in movie business or something and like that. it's so that, saturated. Right? But yeah, well, but I mean, but then again, uh, but I, I don't know. It's funny just, just how it's ironic because I was talking about maybe getting back into YouTube, just reading this book by Jennifer and everything else. But this is not making me want to go back. But <laughs> I think, I think, I think it's just it's ludicrous. It's it's really sad. Uh, and I mean, I guess it's it's just like any clickbait type of thing, right? It's like you yeah, know, you, you 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 even if you know you're going to hate these guys and disagree you want to see what they're gonna what they said and so i just think that's just that's just wow low lives <laughs> you know a lot of people might watch this and say okay well those two guys have some kind of established brand right so they've made some kind of name they've done something and people have seen that already so it's easier for them like like let's be honest <clears throat> tomorrow if you had zero students you could just pick up your phone and like that you would have student like it's not an issue mm-hmm. to get at least some students right so some that's, our, that's our job security that, that's <laughs> why we don't have a lot of job security right so right so new people who are coming in they're trying to answer that question yeah. still so they're trying to think mm. how can i get that that client or how can i build my brand and yeah. what would you say is it is that hard to do today or harder or or easier maybe because of the technology technology makes it easier Learning from people with experience makes it easier. Pe- people like you, for example. Uh, so I think there's that's great. There's a lot of really good quality content that you and others put out there, and then if they really like it, they can, you know, pay membership. You know, do more. Uh, so I think there's there's more guidance based on experience. What's tough is that things change a lot. So a lot of that guidance is like, hey, it's gonna, you know, you got to be ready <laughs> to kind of, you know what I mean. You can't you can't rely on always one thing but there's certain principles you can learn and 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 i think that that wasn't there earlier but earlier it was also easier just organically to put stuff out i knew if it was good it was going to get 
you know, a few thousand views by the time I got home from the supermarket. And now it's like a few thousand views in the next six months. So I'll give me, you know, so that, you know, the things are definitely different with algorithms and less organic reach and needing to, you know, know how to play the game. Um, as, as far as brand, I think brand is really, the brand stuff to me, to reiterate uh, earlier, I was saying, you know, if you can start out with like a group of people, you know, that you're, that you're working with, whether they're paid or not at first. So, you know, Instagram, if you build any kind of following with students or, you know, if you have a chance to teach in a teaching environment, great. If, but if not, and you're, you know, you, 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 you did the CELTA, but you don't have any opportunities, or even if you didn't do any kind of certificate or whatever, you know, if, if you've got, if you've got good stuff and you're experimenting with certain people and, and, and you build, uh, your brand that way, you know, it really is about, a, you know, that niche and your name, what what you're doing, not, not how much you blast yourself out there. I think it's more like building, building it slowly. I think things like that don't change so much um, with technology. So I think, I think if you're starting out, no matter what, even if you're good, you're not as good as you, you need to be yet. You need to get more experience so you gotta you know do do it for even if the audience is small ask them to give you feedback on it you know um share the links with people you know try to get as much feedback on it don't focus so much about like you know the 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 end of you know where you're going to go as much as you know you're putting together the stuff you need to do in order to to get there that's great man yeah great advice for anybody who's trying and to don't start. be afraid to ask for advice try to find talk to people get in get in places you know in the past it was facebook groups it's not as easy now um you know joining up with people like you there and and there are others where there are other you know people starting out and getting advice um is is i think really really important so if you could go back 20 years and give yourself one piece of advice what would you mm, say 20 self? 20 i like that 20 <laughs> Yeah, 20, that's 2003. Um, I'll just say in 2003, I was about a year into uh, being a co-owner of an English school in, in Manhattan, um, 41st Street, right by the library, um, and for Japanese students. So the other owner was a former student of mine. It was, it was exclusively Japanese students, a little private school we had. Uh, they were going to Kaplan and Columbia, NYU for TOEFL, but they needed uh, better TOEFL instruction than they were getting. They want to and and more personalized. So we did a bilingual approach uh, where he taught strategies in Japanese and I taught the content in English. Mm -hmm. uh, and it worked really well. It was a lot of fun. But what I would tell myself at that point, you know, uh, I was definitely my my way of thinking was like what we're doing is so good we're gonna blow up you know just you know six months one year I'll, I'll be a millionaire by the time i'm 40 you know i was just on, on the top of the world I, I was putting in so much work like creating content marketing to students you know especially the the, the i didn't have to do so much of the marketing side of it, but i was i was really just doing what i love and, and making materials that either i still use or i've adapted like so the stuff i knew it was good i knew it was stuff that i could in fact uh, i'm actually uh, just finishing a project developing curriculum for toic uh for a huge university in in paris so the stuff i'm that i created be like eight thousand students are going to use it Right. Wow. So so that the, the basic principles like in that material that I created for Toei is stuff that I was doing 20 years ago. So but, but I was so excited that I was like, oh, my God, you know, I'm going to be successful. Our school's going to be successful. You know, it doesn't usually work that way. And if you're lucky, it does. But so many things can go wrong. So I would tell myself that, look, you're going to get there with that stuff, but it may not be as soon as you think. <laughs> Because things yeah. can get in the way. And by the way, you know, keep your head on straight. Don't get such a big head. I was definitely, you know, much more braggadocious, much more like, you know, what we're doing is the shit, you know. Um, and uh, and it was, and it still is. But, you know, I, I didn't, I couldn't really see, uh, I needed to kind of calm down. I tell myself, you know, calm down. Because, you know, we were we were supposed to have schools two years later in, in, in three cities in Tokyo, in Hawaii, in 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 singapore 
it never happened. Everything fell apart by 2007. We shut it down. You know, so it's like I would I would tell myself, and the fact that that happened and shut down, that's fine, that's normal, and I, I, I'm fine with that. But I would have told myself, you know, expect the unexpected. You know, uh, keep your head on straight. <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of people when they're just getting started, kind of see things as black and white. They they've learned mm. the things, they know the basics, and then they are like, all right, I got this, right? Like if you've ever seen the that picture of the learning curve, it's like goes up super steep and then drops off and then it's like uh like the amount you learn compared to how much you you believe you know and like you start learning yes. you believe you Absolutely. know a lot and then as you yeah. learn more you're like okay i really don't know this and then you're <laughs> like okay i'm starting to get it again and then what you find is like the real experts like when we talk with jennifer and other people mm. then it's all about the gray area it's all about how mm. it's black and white it's all about that and it's all about nuance and detail and totally. and totally. so young people coming in you might think you know it all but like there's always people who are on a higher level in some area so like it's multifaceted what you're doing right like to teach online that you don't have to just be a good english teacher you have to also know how to use technology you also have to also know something about education and teaching mm. philosophy and d different things like this, right? So there's always like room for improvement. Totally, totally is. Yeah, and, and part of that is you have to learn from your mistakes. But you know, there's also I, I wish uh, you know somebody had said sat me down and been like told me some of that then. Yeah, <laughs> me too. But I, I, but I may not have wanted to hear it. You know, I may have been like, yeah, yeah, you know, that's for other people. You know, and I, I was definitely also caught up in like, you know, emerging technologies, you know, uh, not 20 years ago, but like, you know, uh, my problem of, if you said, you know, what would you tell yourself 10 years ago? I, I was, I was similarly like manic about success coming because of, of social media and, you know, uh, MOOCs and, you know, I was going to be the king of, of the English language teaching world and stuff like that. So yeah, same thing. I should have, should have, you know, done but it's a little more, level, you know, uh, I don't know if you've ever listened to some of Lil Wayne's music, but uh, a little bit. I mean, I recognize, I recognize his, his, his own type of genius. It's just not my style of music. So I don't listen to it usually. So like in one of the intros or, or skits in one of the albums was like an interview with him saying, like, he, he said, I don't think I'm better than anybody individually, spiritually, physically, any of that. But when it comes to this game, I'm better than everybody. And I think mm. everybody needs to believe that in order to be the best that they can be. That's a good point. So that's that that's that line, you know, and I and I do think uh, if I haven't found a way to to walk it, I'm I'm pretty close. Because I think you're right, but it's 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 a it's the mentality of of, get, of being confident and, and 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 that that's that has to that has to be there. Um, so I think it's also a lot in 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 your behavior and like sort of what you tell yourself about yourself more than like just that feeling of confidence. You know that that that's healthy. You've got to have that. You, you recognize what you have that that is is really valuable without like you know. Uh, allowing yourself to do kind of you know take chances and do silly things and not see you know where you should be going with it mm -hmm. hey man thank you so much for your time today uh, tell well, everybody where they can find you yeah i mean um easiest thing is just you know a search for fluency mc on google or whatever you prefer and then you can get to the different things uh i'm one of these guys that's you know abandon his website and still needs to deal with that so the website's not very good although it hopefully will be uh at some point so i would say you know youtube for for videos to practice english uh instagram it's all fluency mc um instagram if you want to see where i go and travel to I also put some some uh some music on there some little things i do on there um yeah tiktok less yeah main, mainly mainly youtube instagram I'm always happy. I'm always happy. Um, I mean, one of the advantages of not having like this huge uh, thing online is that I I can answer you know emails uh, for people who are really curious 
uh, about and want to find my stuff more directly. I do have a, a teacher's activity book that I sell that does pretty well for teachers uh, on my website. So if you are a teacher, um, you can you can check that out. But otherwise, I'm not really I'm not really marketing stuff at the moment. Uh, but I'm happy to answer any questions people have after listening. I'll, I'll, my email is support at fluencymc.com. So please include the email because I get really great emails from people. And I love I love answering. Them, so awesome. Yeah, we'll put all the links under the video or under the podcast episode. So yeah. you can find Fluency MC. All right. Thanks, right. man. Uh, pleasure. Thanks so much, Chris. Take it easy. Bye, everybody. Thank you for tuning in to English World with Chris Americos. Now it's your turn. Don't just listen to English, speak English with us every day. Join our English Everyday Speaking Program today. See you in the next episode. Bye-bye.